Cool. Okay, uh, we're going to talk about test-driven leadership and crafting testable strategies. But I want to do a little bit of a story first. Has anybody heard of the Hawthorne effect? No. This is amazing. This is a great story. So a hundred years ago, in 1924, in Illinois, a guy called Elton Mayo was doing some experiments with his workforce. He worked in a factory, and they wanted to improve the output of the factory, and so he was like, okay, let's, let's think about the variables we have in a factory. Let's run some experiments, and let's find out which variables improve productivity. So the first thing he thought was maybe changing the light brighter would increase productivity. So he turned the lights in the factory up. Productivity went up. Being a good scientist, what did he do next? He turned the lights down. Productivity went up. He put the lights back to where they were in the beginning. Productivity went up. So he, he thought to himself, what's going on here? And what's going on here is something called the Hawthorne effect, which is effectively, if people feel like they're being observed, <laughs> their productivity goes up. This, this story is a great story because it tells us a lot about human psyche, but nobody put your hands up in the beginning when I asked who knew about this. And that's kind of what a lot of this talk, uh, the next 15 minutes or so, is about, is when we move from uh, one career into another career, or we go from being an IC to a leader, there's often a lot of lack of knowledge because we don't have it. When I learned to be a leader, there wasn't the 50 you know, inch thick book on Java that I read to become a Java engineer. That didn't exist for leadership. And so a lot of the, the tools and techniques that we have as leaders, we've got to learn in different ways. And this Hawthorne effect is one of them. My wife, uh, had a few different careers. She worked in uh, buying for a supermarket, she worked in project management, she worked in marketing, she worked in business development, and she eventually decided she wanted to move into user experience. And she felt floundered by all of the new things she had to do. But actually looking at what she did in the other careers she had, there's a lot of transferable skills. So I want to talk about transferable skills and the way they work in leadership. So uh, this is a lightning talk. I'm not going to go into this a lot, but I've been doing this kind of stuff for about 15 years in leadership and been training this stuff for about five years. If you want to know more about that, I've got a few other talks on where we're going. So in this area of going, how do we find tools and techniques that work in leadership? I want you to think about the tools and techniques that you know from software development and we're going to see how we can apply those to leadership. So I keep saying technique. What does technique mean? Well, my definition of technique is we've got opportunities, and we've got experts, and we apply a technique to those two things to get the outcome that we want. So if, we've, if we're building software, and we've got a bunch of software engineers, and we have an opportunity to build a new feature, we're going to apply a certain set of techniques over those software engineers. And there's a bunch of stuff here that I'm sure we've all seen before. You know, we all, we all know what most of these words mean. But these are the techniques of building software. We take a bunch of engineers and design people and product managers and marketing and sales people sometimes, and we apply these techniques to get an outcome. So we might have uh, identified an opportunity for building a feature, and we go, OK, well, how do we build that feature? Let's use microservices to build that feature. Opportunity, experts, te technique. We do not have this grid for leadership in the same way often. Uh, when I got moved into leadership, I, I was moved into leadership because I was the longest tenure software engineer. I had no idea what I was doing in leadership. I had just been doing the job as an engineer for longer than anybody else in the company. And so I was just given the hat of leadership despite showing absolutely no uh, talent for it at all. So I thought, OK, how can I take the things that I know from software development and how can I apply them to leadership? And the first one I thought of was test-driven development. A lot of the job of leadership, especially in, in senior levels of leadership, is coming up with strategy. 
So if you're the most senior technologist in an organization, say you're the head of or the director or the CTO, your boss, who is not technical uh, often, comes to you and says, what's our strategy for the next three years? What are we doing about this new AI thing? What are we gonna be taking advantage of? And you've gotta come back to them with a strategy. And often they'll say, okay, I, I want to know quarter by quarter for the next three years what we're doing. Does this sound like something? <laughs> Sounding a little bit like waterfall, isn't it? And we all know the problems with that type of approach, with this waterfall style approach to strategy. We're focusing on getting it right by defining the exact outcome up front. But all of these problems come along with that. We have issues with, we don't even know what the exact outcome is often. We know what we think it is now, but we don't know what it is in three years' time. It might change. We've got to define every step, but what if new opportunities come up or, or new restrictions? It takes a while to plan these strategies. I have spent three months building a three-year strategy before. It takes a long time. And they're very brittle because they're not responsive to change of what's happening. And the other thing with them, nobody reads them. <laughs> a thumbs up in Slack when you post a document doesn't mean somebody's read that document. <laughs> and so the last time I was joining, I, I, do, I did this a few times for a few different companies. And m most recently, uh, a couple of years ago, I joined a company called Linktree. Uh, where I was responsible for the migration uh, and the improvement of the mobile side of things. So we already had an existing web application, and we, were, uh, we had to build a mobile application. And we've built the first MVP of mobile, and now we were going, okay, what's the sustainable way of doing mobile going forward? So I had to build out a mobile strategy. And I thought to myself, there has to be a better way. I'm not locking myself in a room for three months and building a strategy again. Like, there has to be a better way of building this strategy. And so I thought, okay, what do I know? From my software development experience, what do I know solves these sorts of problems? What's the shape of this issue where we're defining everything up front and, and we're kind of going through all the step by step, et cetera, et cetera? And it's, it's waterfall, and, and one of the techniques we use to kind of break those things down and make things work in that environment is test-driven development. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time on TDD. Most people in this room probably know what it is, but the way that I like to break TDD down and kind of explain it for non-technical audiences, which is all we're we're kind of doing here, is that you know you've got your red, green, blue refactor, where your red is effectively define the smallest bit you want to do next and how you know you've done it well. Green is do it and check it you've done it well, and then blue is can you refactor or can you improve what you're doing. And when I take TDD and I break it down in this way, you can start seeing how it applies outside of software development. The, the core concepts of it are, can apply in a lot of different areas. We can take a strategy and we can define the smallest slice of a strategy. We can define and have metrics around how we know if a strategy is doing well. And we can look at a strategy that's evolved over time and go, can we improve this by breaking bits off uh, and refactoring the strategy? So this is what I did. Rather than locking myself in a room for three months and coming up with a three-year strategy, I said, okay, let's take the first smallest meaningful step. What does that look like? And how do I know that went well? Because that's the crucial bit. If you're just defining the smallest slice, that's a good first step but you've got to know if that goes well. well. So what are the metrics that I can use to apply with that? The first idea I had was, okay, what if we had a mobile engineering squad that we implanted each member of that squad in somebody else's squad to help them build the mobile app? So you know, we would have a squad that was responsible for the web user journey, and I would implant a, a mobile engineer in that squad to help them build out that journey on mobile. That was my first idea. Tried that idea and it didn't work. It didn't work because that engineer basically just became responsible for all of the, the mobile dev in that squad. And so if I'd have built a three-year strategy based on that technique, it would have just fallen flat on its face. 
But because that was a small slice, a small experiment, I was like, okay, let's, let's reset. That obviously doesn't work. And let's look at how things like DevOps work and, and SRE, and let's treat this mobile squad as consultants coming in and helping the teams own their own journeys. And that was the next experiment we did. And that one worked. But I wouldn't have gotten to that if I hadn't have tried the first experiment. So really, all we're talking about here is taking a strategy and rather than having this big, expansive thing, making small, incremental, frequent changes rather than relying on this long-term stuff, which mitigates the risk associated with it. That's what we're doing. You know, if, if you think about uh, TDD as a coding concept, we're not writing uh, a million lines of code and then pressing the test button and crossing our fingers. We're writing small incremental bits of code which reduces the risk. Same with the strategies. It enhances the team dialogue. You've got people talking to each other all the time because you don't have to go, okay, before you attend this meeting, you've got to read the 60-pager. You can have a small thing that people discuss and talk about together and you have lots of small meetings. And really what we're talking about here is driving towards a more emotionally intelligent way of doing leadership in technology, which is taking the people to be a core part of it. So I started this talk with a discussion on light bulbs, and then I went into UX, and then I went into TDD and strategy. There is an overarching narrative here, and it's mainly the narrative I want you to take away from this, rather than my specific examples. It can be overwhelming when you move into a new role, especially when you go from being an individual contributor to a leader, for example. You've, you've been doing this thing that you're really, really good at. You've got to where you are because you're good at it. And now you're in a place where you're doing things you're maybe not so good at because you've never done them before. Either that's because you're doing a career transition, say, moving from development to product management, or you're going from development to DevRel, or you're moving into leadership, but you're going to a place where you were really good at what you did to a place where you're, you're maybe not. And that can be incredibly overwhelming, and I want to really to have you to take a step back and ask yourself the question. The problem in front of you, what's the shape of that problem? What's the generic abstraction of that problem? And where have I seen that before? In the example with my wife as a, a UXer, she knew a lot from her experience as a buyer and a BD and a salesperson about interviewing people to find out what they cared about and what they wanted. That's a big part of what UX people do. From her work as a project manager, she knew a lot about how do you order the, the progression of things and how do you report on that progress. It's a lot of what a UX person does. From my experience as an engineer, I know a lot about taking large, intractable problems, breaking them down, and implementing them. That's a lot about what leadership does. So that's the main narrative I want you to take away from this. Uh, if you want to know more about this kind of stuff, come have a chat with me. I love talking about this. I never get bored. Thank you.